Thrown Away by Rudyard Kipling And some are sulky, while some will plunge. So ho, steady, stand still, you. Some you must gentle, and some you must lunge. They are there, who wants to kill you? Some, there are losses in every trade, will break their hearts ere bitted and made, will fight like fiends as the rope cuts hard, and die dumb mad in the breaking yard. To Langala Stockyard Chorus. To rear a boy under what parents call the sheltered life system is, if the boy must go into the world and fend for himself, not wise. Unless he be one in a thousand, he has certainly to pass through many unnecessary troubles. And may possibly come to extreme grief, simply from ignorance of the proper proportions of things. Let a puppy eat the soap in the bathroom or chew a newly blacked boot. He chews and chuckles until by and by he finds out that blacking and old brown Windsor make him very sick. So he argues that soap and boots are not wholesome. Any old dog about the house will soon show him the unwisdom of biting big dog's ears. Being young, he remembers, and goes abroad at six months, a well-mannered little beast with a chastened appetite. If he had been kept away from boots and soap and big dogs, till he came to the trinity full-grown and with developed teeth, just consider how fearfully sick and thrashed he would be. Apply that notion to the sheltered life and see how it works. It does not sound pretty, but it is the better of two evils. There was a boy once who had been brought up under the sheltered life theory, and the theory killed him dead. He stayed with his people all his days, from the hour he was born till the hour he went into Sandhurst nearly at the top of the list. He was beautifully taught in all that wins marks by a private tutor, and carried the extra weight of, quote, never having given his parents an hour's anxiety in his life. What he learnt at Sandhurst beyond the regular routine is of no great consequence. He looked about him, and he found soap and blacking, so to speak, very good, He ate a little, and came out of Sandhurst not so high as he went in. Then there was an interval and a scene with his people, who expected much from him. Next a year of living unspotted from the world in a third-rate depot battalion, where all the juniors were children and all the seniors old women. And lastly, he came out to India, where he was cut off from the support of his parents, 
and had no one to fall back on in time of trouble except himself. Now India is a place, beyond all others, where one must not take things too seriously. The midday sun always accepted. Too much work and too much energy kill a man just as effectively as too much assorted vice or too much drink. Flirtation does not matter, because everyone is being transferred, and either you or she leave the station and never return. Good work does not matter, because a man is judged by his worst output, and another man takes all the credit of his best as a rule. Bad work does not matter, because other men do worse, and incompetence hang on longer in India than anywhere else. Amusements do not matter, because you must repeat them as soon as you have accomplished them once, and most amusements only mean trying to win another person's money. Sickness does not matter, because it's all in the day's work, and if you die, another man takes over your place and your office in the eight hours between death and burial. Nothing matters except home furlough and acting allowances. And these only because they are scarce. This is a slack, kutcha country where all men work with imperfect instruments. And the wisest thing is to take no one and no thing in earnest, but to escape as soon as ever you can to some place where amusement is amusement and a reputation worth the having. But this boy, the tale is as old as the hills, came out and took all things seriously. He was pretty and was petted. He took the petting seriously and fretted over women not worth saddling a pony to call upon. He found his new free life in India very good. It does look attractive in the beginning, from a subaltern's point of view. All ponies, partners, dancing, and so on. He tasted it as the puppy tastes the soap. Only he came late to the eating, with a growing set of teeth. He had no sense of balance, just like the puppy, and could not understand why he was not treated with the consideration he received under his father's roof. This hurt his feelings. He quarrelled with other boys and being sensitive to the marrow, remembered these quarrels, and they excited him. He found whist and gymkhanas and things of that kind meant to amuse one after office good. But he took them seriously too, just as he took the head that followed after drink. He lost his money over whist and gymkhanas, because they were new to him. He took his losses seriously. 
and wasted as much energy and interest over a two gold moor race for maiden ecker ponies with their manes hogged as if it had been the derby. One half of this came from inexperience, much as the puppy squabbles with the corner of the hearthrug, and the other half from the dizziness bred by stumbling out of his quiet life into the glare and excitement of a livelier one. No one told him about the soap and the blacking, because an average man takes it for granted that an average man is ordinarily careful in regard to them. It was pitiful to watch the boy knocking himself to pieces, as an overhandled colt falls down and cuts himself when he gets away from the groom. This unbridled license, in amusements not worth the trouble of breaking line for, much less rioting over, endured for six months, all through one cold weather. And then we thought that the heat, and the knowledge of having lost his money and health and lamed his horses, would sober the boy down, and he would stand steady. In ninety-nine cases out of a hundred, this would have happened. You can see the principle working in any Indian station. But this particular case fell through, because the boy was sensitive and took things seriously. As I may have said some seven times before, Of course, we couldn't tell how his excesses struck him personally. They were nothing very heartbreaking or above the average. He might be crippled for life financially and want a little nursing. Still, the memory of his performances would wither away in one hot weather. And the shroff would help him to tide over the money troubles. But he must have taken another view altogether, and have believed himself ruined beyond redemption. His colonel talked to him severely when the cold weather ended. That made him more wretched than ever, and it was only an ordinary colonel's wigging. What follows is a curious instance of the fashion in which we are all linked together and made responsible for one another. The thing that kicked the beam in the boy's mind was a remark that a woman made when he was talking to her. There is no use in repeating it, for it was only a cruel little sentence wrapped out before thinking that made him flush to the roots of his hair. He kept himself to himself for three days, and then put in for two days' leave to go shooting near a canal engineer's rest house about thirty miles out. He got his leave, and that night at mess was noisier and more offensive than ever. He said that he was, quote, going to shoot big game, and left at half past ten o'clock in an ecker. Partridge, which was the only thing a man could get near the rest house, is not big game, so everyone laughed.
Next morning, one of the majors came in from short leave and heard that the boy had gone out to shoot big game. The major had taken an interest in the boy and had more than once tried to check him in the cold weather. The major put up his eyebrows when he heard of the expedition and went to the boy's room where he rummaged. Presently he came out and found me leaving cards on the mess. There was no one else in the anteroom. He said, The boy has gone out shooting. Does a man shoot teeter with a revolver and a writing case? I said, Nonsense, Major, for I saw what was in his mind. He said, Nonsense or nonsense, I'm going to the canal now, at once. I don't feel easy. Then he thought for a minute and said, Can you lie? You know best, I answered. It's my profession. Very well, said the Major. You must come out with me now, at once, in an ecker, to the canal to shoot Black Buck. Go and put on a shicker kit, quick, and drive here with a gun. The Major was a masterful man, and I knew that he would not give orders for nothing. So I obeyed, and on return found the Major packed up in an ecker, gun cases and food slung below, all ready for a shooting trip. He dismissed the driver and drove himself. We jogged along quietly while in the station. But as soon as we got to the dusty road across the plains, he made that pony fly. A country bred can do nearly anything at a pinch. We covered the thirty miles in under three hours, but the poor brute was nearly dead. Once I said, What's the blazing hurry, Major? He said, quietly, The boy has been alone by himself for one, two, five, fourteen hours now. I tell you, I don't feel easy. This uneasiness spread itself to me, and I helped to beat the pony. When we came to the canal engineer's rest house, the major called for the boy's servant. But there was no answer. Then we went up to the house, calling for the boy by name. But there was no answer. Oh, he's out shooting, said I. Just then I saw through one of the windows a little hurricane lamp burning. This was at four in the afternoon. We both stopped dead in the veranda, holding our breath to catch every sound. And we heard inside the room the burr, burr, burr of a multitude of flies. The Major said nothing, 
but he took off his helmet, and we entered very softly. The boy was dead on the charpoy in the center of the bare lime-washed room. He had shot his head nearly to pieces with his revolver. The gun cases were still strapped, so was the bedding, and on the table lay the boy's writing case with photographs. He had gone away to die like a poisoned rat. The Major said to himself softly, Poor boy, poor, poor devil. Then he turned away from the bed and said, I want your help in this business. Knowing the boy was dead by his own hand, I saw exactly what that help would be. So I passed over to the table, took a chair, lit a cheroot, and began to go through the writing case. The Major, looking over my shoulder and repeating to himself, We came too late, like a rat in a hole. Poor, poor devil. The boy must have spent half the night in writing to his people and to his colonel and to a girl at home. And as soon as he had finished, must have shot himself. For he had been dead a long time when we came in. I read all that he had written and passed over each sheet to the major as I finished it. We saw from his accounts how very seriously he had taken everything. He wrote about disgrace which he was unable to bear, indelible shame, criminal folly, wasted life, and so on. Besides a lot of private things to his father and mother, too much too sacred to put into print. The letter to the girl at home was the most pitiful of all, and I choked as I read it. The Major made no attempt to keep dry-eyed. I respected him for that. He read and rocked himself to and fro, and simply cried like a woman without caring to hide it. The letters were so dreary and hopeless and touching. We forgot all about the boy's follies, and only thought of the poor thing on the charpoy and the scrawled sheets in our hands. It was utterly impossible to let the letters go home. They would have broken his father's heart and killed his mother after killing her belief in her son. At last the Major dried his eyes openly and said, Nice sort of thing to spring on an English family. What shall we do? I said, knowing what the Major had brought me but for. The boy died of cholera. We were with him at the time. We can't commit ourselves to half measures. Come along. Then began one of the most grimly comic scenes I have ever taken part in. The concoction of a big written lie, bolstered with evidence, to soothe the boy's people at home. 
I began the rough draft of a letter, the major throwing in hints here and there, while he gathered up all the stuff that the boy had written and burnt it in the fireplace. It was a hot, still evening when we began, and the lamp burned very badly. In due course I got the draft to my satisfaction, setting forth how the boy was the pattern of all virtues, beloved by his regiment, with every promise of a great career before him, and so on. How we had helped him through the sickness. It was no time for little lies, you will understand. And how he had died without pain. I choked while I was putting down these things and thinking of the poor people who would read them. Then I laughed at the grotesqueness of the affair, and the laughter mixed itself up with the choke. And the Major said that we both wanted drinks. I am afraid to say how much whiskey we drank before the letter was finished. It had not the least effect on us. Then we took off the boy's watch, locket, and rings. Lastly, the Major said, We must send a lock of hair, too. A woman values that. But there were reasons why we could not find a lock fit to send. The boy was black-haired, and so was the Major, luckily. I cut off a piece of the Major's hair above the temple with a knife, and put it into the packet we were making. The laughing fit and the chokes got hold of me again, and I had to stop. The Major was nearly as bad. And we both knew that the worst part of the work was to come. We sealed up the packet, photographs, locket, seals, ring, letter, and lock of hair, with the boy's sealing wax and the boy's seal. Then the Major said, For God's sake, let's get outside, away from the room, and think. We went outside and walked on the banks of the canal for an hour, eating and drinking what we had with us until the moon rose. I know now exactly how a murderer feels. Finally we forced ourselves back to the room with the lamp and the other thing in it, and began to take up the next piece of work. I am not going to write about this. It was too horrible. We burned the bedstead and dropped the ashes into the canal. We took up the matting of the room and treated that in the same way. I went off to a village and borrowed two big hoes. I did not want the villagers to help, while the Major arranged the other matters. It took us four hours' hard work to make the grave. As we worked, we argued out whether it was right to say as much as we remembered of the burial of the dead. We compromised things by saying the Lord's Prayer with a private, unofficial prayer for the peace of the soul of the boy. 
Then we filled in the grave and went into the veranda, not the house, to lie down to sleep. We were dead tired. When we woke, the Major said wearily, We can't go back till tomorrow. We must give him a decent time to die in. He died early this morning, remember. That seems more natural. So the Major must have been lying awake all the time thinking. I said, then why didn't we bring the body back to the cantonments? The Major thought for a minute. Because the people bolted when they heard of the cholera. And the echo has gone. That was strictly true. We had forgotten all about the echo pony, and he had gone home. So we were left there alone, all that stifling day, in the canal rest house, testing and retesting our story of the boy's death to see if it was weak at any point. A native turned up in the afternoon, but we said that a saib was dead of cholera and he ran away. As the dusk gathered, the Major told me all his fears about the boy, and awful stories of suicide or nearly carried out suicide, tales that made one's hair crisp. He said that he himself had once gone into the same valley of the shadow as the boy when he was young and new to the country so he understood how things fought together in the boy's poor jumbled head. He also said that youngsters, in their repentant moments, consider their sins much more serious and ineffaceable than they really are. We talked together all through the evening, and rehearsed the story of the death of the boy. As soon as the moon was up, and the boy theoretically just buried, we struck across country for the station. We walked from eight till six o'clock in the morning, but though we were dead tired, we did not forget to go to the boy's room and put away his revolver with the proper amount of cartridges in the pouch. Also to set his writing case on the table. We found the colonel and reported the death, feeling more like murderers than ever. Then we went to bed and slept the clock round, for there was no more in us. The tale had credence as long as was necessary, for everyone forgot about the boy before a fortnight was over. Many people, however, found time to say that the Major had behaved scandalously in not bringing in the boy for a regimental funeral. The saddest thing of all was a letter from the boy's mother to the Major and me, with big inky blisters all over the sheet. She wrote the sweetest possible things about our great kindness, and the obligation she would be under to us as long as she lived. All things considered, she was under an obligation, but not 
exactly as she meant to.